Hi everybody and welcome to an introduction to corporate finance. What I thought I'd do is introduce myself first and then introduce the course and, and basically get into the big picture of the class. And by the way, if you do take uh, any of these topics that come after this, then I highly recommend that you look at this particular lecture because it puts all those other topics into perspective. Okay, allow me to introduce myself because sometimes people like to know a little bit about who they're listening to, if you like. I always like to start off by saying, yes, I am an American. I was born in the United States, in fact, uh, New Orleans, still trying to teach them how to talk properly over there. But in any case, when I was five, we moved to Europe I grew up in Belgium and England, and I didn't come back to the United States until I was university age. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of West Point, which is the Federal Academy for the Army. Well, Kings Point is also a Federal Academy, except it's for the Merchant Marine. That's cargo ships like container ships and tankers and freighters and so on and so forth. And, and that's what I did. I went to the Merchant Marine Academy. And when I got out, I basically spent a lot of my 20s working in the Merchant Marine. And the main reason I'm telling you that is because for part of that job, or for that job, basically you're only allowed to work about five or six months a year, and, and the rest of the time you head off. And so during one of my vacations, I was asked to teach at Texas A&M. Uh, they have a maritime university in Galveston, Texas. And I found out that, hey, I, I really enjoy teaching. But I wanted to try the real world first, and I wanted a, a job on land, and, and so I got my MBA at Wharton, majored in finance, and then I joined a company called FMC, which is a, a multinational conglomerate, and, and wore a number of different hats there. And then I decided, yes, I still want to be in academia, so I went and got my PhD in finance at the Ohio State University, go Buckeyes. And then I, when I graduated, I got a job at Kennesaw State University and have been working there ever since. And if I may give a shameless shout out for Kennesaw, we are, have recently been ranked as the number one MBA program in, in Georgia of public institutions. So yes, we beat out UGA, we beat out Georgia Tech. Sorry if you're from there. And also I think we're ranked around 22 in the nation for our MBA program. In any case, I'm also, uh, what else, I'm happily married and, and have two great kids. Uh, Clara's 18, uh, Philip is 16, and that's a little bit about me, in case you're interested. So, let me get into my approach to teaching. Essentially, my experience with students is that they don't want just a bunch of theory thrown at them they want to be able to translate it into practice. And so whatever I teach that is theory, the reason I teach it is so I can bridge it with practice. Now, as far as what I'm putting online here, it's just going to be the theory because this will give people an opportunity to look at the theory, but then the way I translate it or bridge it with practice is I use cases, and obviously cases will not be part of what I put online. However, having said that, my teaching style is very understanding oriented. I mean, I, I you know, I, I could not care less about your ability to memorize. I mean, obviously there's some things that one has to memorize, like definitions, just because it's part of the language of finance, if you will, but most, the vast majority of what I'm going to be going through in all these topics is going to be to maximize your understanding. And therefore, for example, I'll never just put up a formula and say, hey, take my word for it. What I'll be doing is, is deriving formulas. And more important than that, as you drive formulas, you're also forced to know what assumptions are inherent in any formula. And I would argue that the assumptions are actually more important than the formula itself, because only if you understand the assumptions do you have any chance 
of using judgment when it comes to bridging theory with practice. So I tell my, my students, hey, you know, this is an interactive class. There's no such thing as a dumb question. And obviously, with our interaction online, there's not going to be a chance for questions. But what I'll be doing often is I'll be asking questions, and then I'll pause, give you a chance to think about it, and then I'll try to give you a, a logical reason for an answer. You know, I kind of feel like Winnie the Pooh sometimes, you know, where he says to himself or, or whatever. So with that aligned, let me introduce the course. So basically what I want to do is just get into the big picture. Obviously, I'm not going to get into details. And what it'll do is it'll provide you, in a sense, with a roadmap of not exactly what I'm doing, but why I'm doing it. So I'm not one of these teachers that says, all right, well, today we'll do chapter four because it follows chapter three. I want people to have an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. In fact, even when I teach my class, I, I don't teach out of the book. I, I think it's a good idea to have a finance book as a reference, but my reason for teaching what I teach is, is not as I said, well, because chapter five follows chapter four or whatever it is. So here this is, this is corporate finance, and <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing. I mean, you know, I always forget what finance means. So, so what does finance mean? What, what do you think of when you think of finance? Well, maybe you've bought a car lately, say in the past year or two, or have you ever bought a car? And, and when you bought a car, especially if it was a new car, what, what do you think the, or how did you pay for it? Well, one answer might have been, well, I financed it. So basically, what finance means is to raise money. So when, when you finance a car, you, you borrow money to buy the car, and financing means to raise money. So if you look at the picture there, basically the representation of a corporation, in the context of what you see there, what are two major decisions that a company makes? Well, you can essentially think of it in terms of left side and right side. And, and basically, the left side is what I refer to as the asset investment decision. You know, all, all the textbooks are going to call it capital budgeting. But I call it the asset investment decision because that's, that's literally what a company is doing. It's what they spend their money on. So, for example, or, or you tell me, what would an example be of, a, of an asset investment decision? Well, what if a company buys land? Would that be an asset? It would, right? And so, essentially, one example of an asset investment decision is, is buying land, something that a company spends their money on. What about Apple investing in the iPhone? Did they have to spend a bunch of money to get the iPhone up and running? Did they have to hire scientists and R&D and, and, and infrastructure and so on and so forth? They did, right? So when Apple invested in the iPhone, that was an asset investment decision. What about for example, uh, hiring a CEO. Would that be an asset investment decision? Now, some of you might be thinking, well, no, that, that's, that's not an asset investment decision because you, you don't put, you know, uh, Steve Jobs or whatever on the balance sheet, right? And that's true from an accounting perspective. But from a finance perspective, what we care about is what are you spending your money on that hopefully creates value? Of course, in some cases it destroys value, but we can get to that a little bit later on. So in any case, examples of asset investment decisions might be Boeing investing in the Dreamliner and hiring a new CEO and Apple with the iPhone and so on and so forth. So it's what a company spends its money on. 
Now what's another big picture decision that you see? Well basically the right hand side, okay? The financing decision. Now the financing decision is not well I wonder if I'll raise money or not. And the reason it's not well I wonder if I'll raise money or not is because you have to raise money if you're going to spend it on something. So, so given that you have a business given that you have an asset investment decision you have to raise money. So, so the financing decision rather than being well I wonder if I'll raise money or not what do you think it is? Well essentially it's well given that I'm going to raise money well am I going to have no debt and all equity or or 40 percent debt and 60 percent equity in other words it's literally the structure of the capital or the money that you're going to uh, be raising. So my next question is well what decision do you think is more important? Do you think the asset investment decision is more important? Or the financing decision? Or do you think they're both equally important? Well, I haven't really read this in a textbook, to be honest with you, so, so, so maybe there, there are some that would argue with me. But I, I think most, if you will, finance people would probably agree that the asset investment decision is the most important. I mean, that, that's, that's your business plan. That, if it's a good business plan, like say with Coke over the past who knows how many decades their stock has gone up and split and up and split and up and split. And, and, and is that because you think they produced products like, like Coke itself or because maybe they changed from 40% debt to 42% debt or whatever it is? Well, let's look at Apple. When, when Apple came out with a, a totally new way to sell uh, music, Okay, when they came out with iTunes, was that an asset investment decision? It was, right? And and then they they came out with uh, you know MacBook Pros and iPhones and 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 iPads and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, the iTunes thing. I, I like to think of it as you know how they, if you have daughters or whatever, they slowly bleed your wallet dry one dollar at a time. But, uh, but anyway, and it can also work the other way around. I mean, look at Enron. You know, the, the business plan that they had ultimately led to their demise, one could argue, um, amongst other things. Obviously, Enron's a, a complicated question. And so the point is, is that you could make the best decisions in the world for the financing decision. You can have the exact perfect capital structure, if you will. But if you don't have a good business plan, what's going to happen to the company? Well, ultimately, it'll go bankrupt. Okay? And, and you know, on, on the other hand, you can have a, a, a great uh, you know, asset investment decision. You have a great business plan. And, and the financing decision, it's important that that also be optimal, your capital structure but it's not necessarily, you could make bad decisions on that side and it's not necessarily going to undo your great business plan. So as an example, and the reason I put this up here is because one of the cases that I do in my class is, is the Boeing case, which, which I had the honor to co-author with Bob Bruno, that's a, a Darden case. And so there you see Boeing announcing, hey, we're going to invest in the Dreamliner, and and three years later, their stock has tripled. Now, obviously, there's other stuff going on, and and this does not prove that hey, the asset investment decision is the, the you know the only important thing. There's obviously other things, but maybe you might think of this as supportive supportive evidence. So. So let me talk about the big picture of this class. And, and that is basically, as I mentioned earlier, my goal is not, well, well we're going to do chapter four because it follows chapter three. My anchor, if you will, in this class is to get into financial principles as it affects firm value. 
what that means is that that's my lighthouse. That means every single topic has to relate to firm value, and I have to be able to justify why it relates to firm value. Okay? For example, what is a really useful um, tool to have when you create a jigsaw puzzle? Well, it's, it's a picture of the jigsaw puzzle, right? And so this is what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to give you this picture, and then every single topic that I'm going to be going through, if you will, is like one of the jigsaw puzzle pieces. And so that way, when we do the particular jigsaw puzzle piece, you'll know where it fits into that big picture. And in the context of this class, my goal is to do the theory and practice of what I call the asset investment decision. So for example, when Boeing decided to, to invest in the Dreamliner, they obviously did all of this analysis that wouldn't guarantee that if they engaged in the Dreamliner that it would make them money on a risk-adjusted basis, but it just made it more likely because they were making a more informed, or if you will, richer decision. Now obviously with what I put online, as I've said before, I can only cover the theory. But, but when I can, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll bring in maybe anecdotal stuff, but, but I'm not doing the case stuff online. So that's the goal of this corporate finance class. Online is the theory of the asset investment decision, and of course in the class as a whole, the theory and practice of the asset investment decision. So, so here is a roadmap for the theory part of the asset investment decision. Measuring value, the asset investment decision, or again, what some companies call capital budgeting, valuing stocks and bonds, discount rate for financial securities, discount rate for asset investment decision, etc., etc. And there's a logic as to why this is the roadmap. There's, there's a reason why I go in this order. So the very first topic is going to be measuring value. And if you've had a prerequisite or if you've had a, a, you know, a class similar, then, then maybe you'll recall the name of the model that you learned for measuring value. You want a clue? Oh my, look at the time. The time value of money. And so the question begs, well, wh why have a model to measure value? Well, remember, the theme of this class was what? Financial principles as it affects firm value. And what we're going to be looking at is the theory and practice of one specific decision. That's the asset investment decision. Well, if you're going to be making decisions about managing value, does it help to be able to measure value? Well, presumably it does, right? The example that I like to give a lot is what I frame in, in terms of a diet. If you go on a diet, what is a really useful instrument to have? A scale, right? Because if you have a scale, not only can you tell how much weight are you gaining or how much weight are you losing, but you can tell how much you're gaining or how much you're losing. And so it enables you to determine whether or not your diet is working or not. And so a very lo very logical first topic to begin with is measuring value or, or let's, let's be able to measure the impact of our decisions. Now obviously we'll get into this in detail. This is our first topic. But just as an introduction, because it's relevant to the future topics and getting those in perspective. If you did ever take time value money, what two items did you need to value anything? Well, it turns out cash flows and a discount rate. Let me give you an example for that. So for example, there you see a timeline diagram and you expect at time period one to get $110, so that's the cash flow. And if the discount rate were 10%, then what would it be worth today? 
And so just to illustrate, the answer would be $100. Again, I'll get into the whys when we cover this topic in detail, but the only point about what I'm doing here is to say, well, two items that I need to value anything are cash flows and a discount rate. By the way, just as a sidebar, you know, many books have many different notations. I, I've just brought up an example here. But I want to get across the point that a discount rate is a is sort of a catch-all phrase. So for example, if I have uh, if I have um, uh, water in, in, in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other hand, well, the water and the coffee, they're both what? They're liquids, right? And so the same is true of the discount rate. The discount rate is like the liquid, and then there are many different types of discount rates. For example, interest rates and cost of capital, and so on and so forth. So what I'll be doing when I use discount rates, I'll use the term R, and then I'll have a subscript where it's appropriate to make it obvious what I'm referring to. So for, for example, RE would be required rate of return of equity. All right, so what's the next topic? All right, so first topic, we've now gotten, we've now figured out how to measure value. Well, now we're gonna apply that to what is arguably the most important decision that a firm makes and that is the asset investment decision. And again, if you had a, a prereq in finance before, do you remember what in theory had to be true for an asset investment decision to create value, at least with respect to what you quantify? Well, a bottom line analysis with an asset investment decision is net present value, and again, we'll be going into this in more detail, and it had to be positive net present value. So just as a quick preview, for example, if you spent $1,000 today, so company, hey, I, I buy my lemonade stand, all right? So buy my lemonade stand, and because of that, I expect to reap $1,200 uh, a year later, because, you know, I, I I create sales, and then you know I have to buy lemons, and then of course I have to pay my kids slave wages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in the end, I spend thousand. I expect to get back twelve hundred. If the discount rate that applies to that particular asset investment risk, and again we'll get into more details uh, as we do the topics, but if the discount rate is ten percent, then the MPV as illustrated there would be. $91 roughly. But the main point is, what two items did I need to value this decision? If in doubt, the answer is cash flows and a discount rate. So in any case, as we do this NPV, we need cash flows and a discount rate. For now, we're going to assume that we know what the discount rate is. That's a huge assumption, right? I mean, we're arguing that the asset investment decision is the most important decision a firm makes. We're saying NPV is sort of bottom line analysis. And you need two things to, an, to do an NPV, cash flows and a discount rate. And we're assuming we, we just know what the discount rate is. And, and the answer is that we're going to figure that out later. But just for now, we're going to assume we know what it is. Third topic is... Now we'll move to the right-hand side of the balance sheet. We'll say, hey, why is debt worth 400 and why is equity worth 600 And again, we're just going to apply you know, time value of money principles. And so I'm not going to magically or you know, change how we measure value. You, you know, we're going to need two things. Well, what two things will we need? Cash flows and a discount rate. But again, for now, we'll be assuming that we know the discount rate for financial securities. Then we'll stay at the right hand side of the balance sheet and we'll say, well, what is the discount rate for financial securities? And the only reason, the only reason we're going to get into the kind of depth that it's going to take us to, to, to you know, figure out the discount rate should be for financial securities is because 
it turns out that the discount rate for financial securities is highly related to the discount rate for the asset investment decision. In other words, you cannot understand the discount rate for the asset investment decision unless you understand the discount rate for financial securities. And as we said earlier, point number one, asset investment decision, arguably the most important decision a firm makes. Point number two, what was some bottom line analysis needed to create at least an idea of whether a company, whether an asset investment decision was expected to create value if a firm decides to do it. That was net present value, right? And what two things did you need to esti- uh, to calculate a net present value? Cash flows and a discount rate. But we assumed that we knew the discount rate for the asset investment decision. So, so at this point, we've circled all the way around and the final topic is, well, what should be the discount rate for the asset investment decision? And so that's basically you know, the five topics that we'll be covering. It's why we're covering them. And so you know, th- there is the roadmap. And let me preface it by saying that there are going to be times when we get into a lot of depth with all those areas. And my commitment to you is that there's not going to be anything, anything that I bring up just for the fun of it. You know, the, the kind of depth that we're going to be getting to, into is, is relevant because when I do cases or, or other ways that I bridge theory with practice, I'm going to be drawing on the depth that we got into with the theory. So with that in mind, I hope you uh, enjoy and, and learn as much as possible from what I'm putting online here for corporate finance. Thank you.